thanks for joining me for this talk on porting malware analysis uh, into getting uh, established and novel techniques. So as Martin said, I'm Guillaume Cahier. I'm the team lead uh, at Okiok for the Fantas team. Uh, I'm a huge NordSec fan. I've been participating for the last few years, and it's always a pleasure to be here. Um, as you will see in the next slides, I really like Nimlang as a programmatic language. So every proof of concept that I will um, publish today on GitHub are written in Nimlang, but be assured you can translate them in less optimal languages like Rust, Go, or C. That was a joke, please don't throw rocks at me. <laughs> so here's what we will cover today. Uh, but first, where this research started. So um, obviously, when you do red teaming, you need to craft your own payload, because if you use anything public, you will get burned instantly. It's not even worth doing it. So when you spend that amount of time creating your, those special uh, precious tradecraft, the last thing you want to the last thing you want that to happen as a red teamer is the blue team getting a hand on your payload and creating a bunch of signature on it, like in one hour or even one day. So uh, yeah, I wanted to, even if my goal is to train the blue team in the end, I wanted to put a better fight, make it more interesting. Uh, and in 2021, there's a one researcher that uh, published uh, a tool that I will present soon. Um, and basically, it was an anti-copy technique. So, a file executed on system A could uh, indefinitely work on system A, but on system B or on various at all after that, it was not possible to execute it. That really sparked my interest because it didn't explain anything about that technique. So I spent a good amount of time trying to understand what it was doing. Um, I found some, some weaknesses. Then I created uh, more proof of concept that uh, improve uh, on that technique. So this is what I will present today uh, as for the novel anti copy techniques. But first, I will present some established techniques that you can use to prevent your payload from being executed in sandboxes or from being reversed. Then we'll, we will talk about detection opportunities and other elements to consider. Established techniques. So the first big category of uh, technique you can use are called guardrails. So the goal of the guardrails is to prevent your payload from being executed in the wrong environment. So it can be either very total, a sandbox, or just not your right target. Um, there's multiple ways you can go about that, so making sure your payload can check that the, the system is joined to a domain, there's a, a good enough number of CPUs, a high number of screen, uh, as the mouse moved in the last few minutes, as the number of window changed in the last few minutes. So all those techniques are really good against sandboxes, a bit less against human, because I, I, I reverse I can just take a look at your payload, see what you're looking for, uh, and just modify his virtual machine. And in the end, you will be able to decrypt your payload, get your shell code, get URLs, secrets, and et cetera. So it has a good point, but some good weaknesses. Um, the next big category of things you can do is, uh, is anti-debugging or anti-reversing technique. So the goal is to prevent a reverser from being able to take your payload, open it in a debugger, like I'm showing here, uh, and being able to, uh, to bypass your uh, basic guardrail. So in, in the GIF at the right, you can see that uh, I implemented two checks. First, when you execute the payload without any debugger running, it, it does not detect a debugger. Uh, but if you open IDA, IDA by, uh, by default creates a few temporary files next to your, to, to your uh, payload. Uh, so I'm checking regularly for that, uh, those type of files. And also in the PEB of the process, there's the uh, am I being debugged uh, uh, value that you can check. So those are two known anti-debug or reversing technique. The more you add in your payload, the, less, the more it's painful for the reverser. So the goal is to add as much as possible so the reverser lose interest and move on to other things. However, a dedicated reverser will in the end be able to, uh, to decrypt your payload because if he has the right tooling and the right knowledge, he can hide itself from, uh, from user mode. Your payload won't, won't see that there's a debug. <clears throat> So here's the first and novel anti copy technique, which is scroll like a king. I didn't develop this. Uh, this was created by A. Draswan. It was presented at WoodCon and ITCON in 2021. Um, before I move on, there's a QR code at the bottom right. I tested this morning. I'm not sure it's possible from the crowd to scan it. Um, but just know that at the end, uh, you can just go on my GitHub and find the repos. So yeah, this. Uh, 
This proof of concept was uh, published in 2000, 2021, and what you can see is the, in the GIF is that at the right is executing uh, the file one time, and then he's moving the file to a second system, and on the second system, it doesn't work anymore. It's, as he was saying, it's naturally broken. But how does it work? Why is it naturally broken once it's on the other system? Well, let me explain it to you. When you have an exe or a DLL, both files are following the PE format. And in the PE format, there's something called the import table. So let's say you have a basic program that when you execute it, it pops a message box. So to, your program to be able to, learn, uh, to spawn a message box needs to call a function in a system DLL on Windows. For message box, it's, it's a user to do that DLL. Um, so the, the import table of your payload needs to have an entry for message box inside that DLL to be able to fetch the address at runtime. So the, the text at the right, the two more important things to, uh, to know today is the original first tank and the first tank, which are a small part of the import table. So the original first tank is a read-only table, uh, which contains the function names of each function that you need at runtime. And uh, at runtime, uh, the first table, the first tongue table, which is empty on disk, will uh, get filled with the real address on the current system for that function. So that every time that function is called again, it's the address stored in fun first tongue that will be used. So here's a small or simple example. In the original first tongue, uh, you could have a few ETW-related function. Uh, at runtime, in first tongue, you will get uh, memory addresses for first tank, uh, in the first tank that, that will get filled in. However, the screw like a king proof of concept does not use function names. Instead, it uses integers. But what are those integers? Those are ordinals. For, so if you uh, open any DLL or system DLL on, on, on Windows, you will see that for each function, uh, the function name is exported, but also a, a small integer that is an ordinal. Uh, and how it works is that the first function of the DLL that is exported will have the number one, the second, number two, and so on and so forth. Um, normally, every, everybody calls function by their, by, by their names because this is more stable. The names don't change. However, it's not the same, uh, same thing for ordinal because for e at every Windows version change, even for small Windows version, cha uh, version changes, the ordinal, the ordinal number can be swapped. So you could have a, a binary that call a function with ordinal, you do a Windows update, suddenly it doesn't work anymore. Not really fun for a normal program. Maybe more interesting for payload. And you might see where I'm going uh, to with, uh, with ordinals. So the, the screw like a king proof of concept, uh, basically what it does is you have two binary, the, the builder and the target file. So the builder will load the target files byte in memory map every, every section uh, of the binary as an image in memory, like when you are doing PE reflection. It will then parse the import table, find every function names, look up the function ordinal on that system, swap the two information so that the import table only has ordinal, and then ever, uh, write, back, uh, write everything back to disk uh, where uh, the file was. So every time the file gets executed again, there's no function names in the import table, only, function ord uh, only ordinals, so it will work on that system, but might, might, maybe not on other system which doesn't have the same Windows build uh, version. Um, so in the end, it's a really efficient technique, but you need to trust your victim to have a different Windows version number than VirusTotal, ORD, or SOC. So it's great, but you have to trust your victim in some way, and I don't want to trust, I don't want to trust any victim, uh, any, any target, so, uh, it has some drawbacks. It's not effective against the same Windows uh, version. I tried to contact the authority, he never answered, but uh, I tested it with, between two systems that has an identical uh, Windows version. And as you can see, even when you apply the screw technique uh, on the first system, like as of right now, calculate, uh, calc still work. On the second system, uh, the same file will run again and work perfectly. So it's a really good technique, but has some weaknesses. So here's what I did. Uh, first, no, <laughs> since I, link, I like Nim, I first uh, translated that technique into Nimlang. Um, and what I did is I improved it, so instead of needing two binary, one that targets the other, 
the, the file overwrite itself and change itself. So you could send one file to your victim once the file is executed once. The file loads itself on memory, change itself with Ordinal, writes itself back to disk. Uh, how it, so it's nicer, you, maybe in some red teaming scenario you don't want to send too many binaries to your target uh, victim. Um, however, it, it has the same weakness. You don't, you, you, it's not effective between the same Windows version. Before I move on to the next technique, there's two concepts I need to uh, talk with you. The first is alternate data stream. For those that don't know what is ADS or alternate data stream, you can look at the image at the right. You can see in that folder I have only one file. It's nartsec.txt. If I try to output its content with the first, uh, the, the first type command, you, you will see the default content. However, with ADS, you can create alternate content in uh, uh, what, what we call alternate data stream. So if I request the, the, the secret alternate data stream, you will see that there's a different content. That's a NTFS function that was created for macOS uh, compatibility. It's mainly used nowadays for web browser, so when you download a file using your browser uh, that is, uh, even if it's signed or unsigned, you will get a zone identifier alternate data stream applied to it. So if the file wasn't signed, when you execute the exe, for example, you will get that big blue screen that we call smart screen uh, to tell you that, hey, that file is not signed. It's the main use nowadays for uh, ADS. Um, however, every file has a default unnamed data stream that when you create a basic file and you open it in, in, uh, in Notepad, for example, that's the default unnamed data stream that you see. The key thing to understand here is that depending how it's done, when you move a file as a, that has an alternate data stream to another system or to virus total, for example, the EDS does not come with it. So that's really inter interesting. Keep that in mind. The next concept is self-deletion. So normally on Windows, it's not possible for a process to delete, or even you, you cannot delete a file which is linked to a running process. So if the file is mapped into memory and the, the process is running, you cannot delete that file. However, Jonas Slick uh, found a way to do it anyway. So how it works is that your payload gets an indole on itself. Rename is default unnamed data stream to something named. Close the handle, reopen, and when it tries to close the handle again, since there is no primary data stream, Windows triggers the file delete itself. So you, you end up with a process in memory that is not linked to any file on disk. So here's the first technique I created, which is I, I call payload rekeying. So the, the goal will be to have a payload that contains encrypted stuff like shellcode, URLs, other secrets, um, and have it executed on a system A while not having any prior information on system A. Then I want that file to always execute successfully on system A, but never again on system B, C, virus total, or other virtual machine. Or, or I, I want it to be hard to execute it or to decrypt the encrypted stuff. So here's the plan. At the right, you can see a X dump of a binary. Uh, the parts in red are uh, encrypted secrets in, in this case. So you could think of variables, URLs, or other stuff. Um, so the payload loads, loads its own bytes in, uh, in memory, locate those secrets, decrypt them with the hard coded key, then generate a new key, store part of that key into ADS or the whole. Uh, and then re-encrypt those decrypted secrets in memory, then overwrite itself back uh, on disk. Few things, so to be able to locate my encrypted secrets, uh, I append and prepend those secrets with a unique pattern that is not commonly found in the byte patterns of a file. Um, then I, I will just show you the quick uh, GIF while I, I, I talk about the rest. Uh, in the GIF, you can see that I am executing a, a nimrikey.exe on system A. I try to re-execute it, it still works. Then I move it on, on system B, uh, which has a mounted, a mounted drive for the same file. Copy it on desktop, re-execute it. Um, it's not, it does not work anymore, and I also added a function that self-delete when it, det it detects that it is, on, it is on another system. So for all of that to work, uh, initially, the key needs to be a hash. It's, it's my implementation because when you replace bytes in your, uh, in your payload, 
you cannot change the length. So my key needs to always be the same length. And this is the same thing for encrypted secrets. So you need to, need, you need to use an encryption algorithm which does not add padding or change the length. The, the, the bytecode need, need to be the same length. So you can use uh, encryption like uh, AES 256 uh, CTR, if I remember correctly. Uh, that encryption does not change anything as for the length. So I keep, I, I store the original key, which is an hash, and I store the, or, the hash of the original hash. And then when I do the rekeying operation, I generate a new key, replace the bytes in memory for that key. And at every run, even on the first, I validate that the hash of the key is the same as the original hash of the hash of the key. So if, if that is different, it means that I'm on the second run. It means that I'm, I'm really, I'm, uh, I am already rekeyed. So yeah, like I said, on subsequent runs, uh, that, that thing is checked. Um, and my pill will know that it needs to use the new key and part, of, part or the whole thing that is stored in ADS to be able to decrypt URL shell code and other secrets. If that decryption fails, I trigger the self-deletion, as you can see in the GIF. The goal is to give less possible opportunities for the blue team to be able to decrypt the payload. Um, yeah. So in that case, the payload becomes bricked if the file is moved to another system, uh, and some, uh, or if the file is uploaded to an online sandbox, or if you, like the SOC analyst download your file using the ADR functionality, in all those cases, the ADS does not, does not come with it. If you, if you have an NTFS USB key and you move the file on it, since it, it's a NTFS function, the ADS will come with it. Uh, but if your USB key is FAT32, for example, yeah, the, the secret will be gone. If you delete the file, the secret is gone. If you move it in any, in most ways, the secret will be gone. Um, this technique was nice, but it, it, it again adds some weaknesses because if the SOC uh, or if the, the analysis process took an image of the, of the system before doing the reverse, the reverse operation, in the end they will, they will know that I'm looking for a key in ADS. If, if they still have the laptop or the system, they can get the secret back. Um, so I want then something even better. Um, so here's the NIM DRM proof of concept. The goal was to build on the strength of the last proof of concept, but even provide, provide even less opportunities for the blue team to, in the end, be able to decrypt your, yeah, the payload. So the approach is that I've completely removed the decryption key from the payload. I'm using an external licensing server. Um, so let me explain the GIF. At the left, you have a license server that runs on system A. At the, at the right, sometimes you have system B. Uh, and the, the file is initially created, uh, executed on system B and can contact the license server on system A. The payload contains a unique license that it sends it to uh, the license server on the first time with many uh, fingerprinting elements like uh, file ashes, host name, and you can get creative with this. The goal is to uh, it, it can look like a anti-cheat or licensing ser server for games, though it's a really cheap version of that. Um, the, you, you can calculate the memory checksum of some important element of your payload uh, to make sure it's not bypassed. You send all that information to the license server. The goal of the license server is to take a decision with what was provided. Uh, if it decides to return the decryption key, uh, it will also send a generated secret. The secret will get stored in ADS. I think you can see the pattern here. Um, and that secret needs to be provided on each subsequent run uh, with all those other uh, unique elements that uh, fingerprint the system. So if any, again, if anything is missing, the Latin server can return a message to self-delete or do other actions. In this case, the license, uh, the, the payload gets bricked for the same reason as before, but if you added all those basic guardrails and anti reversing technique that I talked at the beginning, uh, so if, there, if, some, if someone patched the binary to bypass some basic guardrails, the file hash will be different, uh, so the license will get banned. Uh, if the process is being debugged uh, for any reason, uh, the, process, the, the license will get banned, and more importantly, if as an operator you feel like it's time to close your... Um, your campaign, uh, if, you, if you feel that the SOC is uh, as big in its investigation, you can just ban the license or close your license server, and the decryption key will never get returned again. 
sorry, some detection opportunities. The, the one technique that is all of the proof of concept that I presented today is ADS. Um, so you can use Sysmon to detect that or, or to lock that. But the, as you, the thing you need to know that is that basic configuration for Sysmon online does not look for EXE creating ADS, aside, except if they are in the download startup uh, or temp folder. There are some other Sysmon configuration, like this one from, from Florian that checks for very specific alternate data stream name. Uh, in this case, this is a Cobol strike beacon object file uh, that is public. But as you can see, you cannot always trust hackers to be consistent. There are multiple other GitHub repo that use other alternate data stream. So in the end, this is not really a good detection mechanism. I in initially thought that I had a really good detection uh, idea, is that m my payload right, uh, creates an EDS on itself. So if the main usage of EDS nowadays is a browser creating a, a, a zone identifier EDS, a file creating an, an EDS on itself would be a really good detection. However, as you can see in this, in this Sysmon image, uh, it's not numeriki.exe that creates its EDS, it's explorer.exe. I have no idea why this is the case. I need to investigate more, but uh, for, uh, on all the, the tests I did, it was always explorer.exe. So this is not really nice for a detection opportunity. However, you could be really well baseline your environment for any EDS creation, and aside from zone identifier, um, I don't think there's many more uh, zone identifier uh, uh, EDS creation. So baseline your environment is a really good idea. Uh, an attacker could try to mimic zone, zone identifier EDS, uh, but without other custom content that will not add much value. Another key stuff to, uh, to, to note here, you can see the content. Uh, so the content of my ADS was logged. I can guarantee you that I didn't create it, this Chinese or Asian looking string. So even Sysmon does not monitor correctly the content of ADS being uh, created. So and as a conclusion, anti-copy is really fun. I encourage every red team or pen testing to play with it. Uh, I also encourage every blue team to start play with it because uh, we never know when threat actors start using that, those techniques. Uh, other aspect to consider will be handling of the key. So when you contact your, the license server, for example, and get the decryption key, if the file continues to execute for a long number of time, keeping the, the, the key in memory is dangerous because any blue team can dump your process and get your key. And in the same uh, style of idea, in general, preventing in-memory content carving using custom sleep mask, if you're, if you're using Cobalt Strike, for example, uh, is a nice way to make uh, content carving at runtime di uh, difficult. Uh, today, I start every secret in ADS because I find it nice, it's volatile, and it's, uh, it's hard to notice, but you could store that, that secret in other locations like regedit event log uh, or the file system itself. However, in my opinion, it offers more opportunities for the blue team to find it. Uh, in a short period of time. Well, uh, thank you. So, again, if you want to look at the proof of concept I released today, they are all on my GitHub at offensive teacher, uh, offense teacher, sorry, on, on GitHub. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>